For those of you who may not have the pleasure of my acquaintance, I'm Father Bolin, currently priest in charge of Mineola. The parish there is St. Peter the Apostle, and classmate to Father Braun. I'll accept your condolences later. And uh, he has asked me to do the second part of this talk, for which I am absolutely unqualified, but I'm going to do it anyway and see how it goes. Uh, I, I welcome your questions even in the middle uh, because this is the first time I've given this particular talk and so I will, I do not presume that anything I say is going to be coherent right off the bat so it makes sense in my head but if it's not coming out my mouth let me know, alright? So very good. Well let's go ahead and talk just briefly. There's two points I want to emphasize from Father Braun's talk last time which was a month ago, so I can understand if you don't remember it, but they're fairly simple points. And they're, when he's talking about the classical idea of beauty, he says in his notes here, the classical conception is that beauty consists of an arrangement of integral parts into a coherent whole according to proportion, harmony, symmetry, and similar notions. Okay? One of the things that's going to be important to remember when we talk about art and any, anything, uh, the architecture or anything goes with it, is that um, proportion is not necessarily only within a thing. But when we're talking about art and architecture, it's also, it, there must be a proportion between the thing itself and everything else. So in other words, a, a correspondence between what is actually produced and the reality. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit in when, I, when I talk about architecture this evening. And then in quoting Aristotle's metaphysics, he said, the chief forms of beauty are order and symmetry and definiteness, which the mathematical sciences demonstrate in a special degree. And it's interesting that, of course, Aristotle ties in uh, math, math with beauty, but in reality, it really is uh, connected. Just for example, if any of you study music, you know that there are uh, numerical quantities that are attached to notes because they are, there is a, there's a scientific reality to vibrations, etc. And so there is, a, there is a number pattern in what sounds nice and what doesn't. And so you can say the same thing in a little bit in the visual arts, for example. So these two things to keep in mind, proportion, harmony, symmetry, okay, are important for all of these three talks that we've heard, and of course, Father Stanley will be talking about music itself. I don't know if he's going to bring this particular point up, but um, hopefully I will remember to tell him that I talked about it. So, so just that's the background from the last time. Uh, what I want to start with today is lay down just the one simple principle when it comes to architecture, is that there are two ideas that are important to all buildings. The structure and the purpose, okay? how a church stands up, and what its builders wanted to say. And of course I left it in the car, but the book that I use to get a lot of my material is called How to Read a Church. It should be the only book by that title on Amazon, so if you do want to go look for it, you can find it. How to Read a Church. Small little book, lots of color pictures and diagrams, but it's very compact and very succinct. But these are the two main points then that we're going to talk about today is structure and purpose. And I'm not going to talk as much about structure because there's a lot of legitimate variety in there and the structure in a lot of ways is also reflective of the purpose. And so I really want to give most of my attention today to the purpose. But just to talk about, uh, for example, styles of church buildings. Um, there's a long history of different styles, and had um, Murphy not been against me uh, today, I would have been able to give you a few visual examples, but I'm not going to go into them because, again, I would have done so only briefly anyway, and that is that the, the history of church buildings uh, are, is very, there's a great variety, uh, most of them beautiful, okay? 
Um, we start off in the early days of Christianity with Gre uh, Greek and Roman influences, of course, where we see things, for example, the use of columns frequently. An interesting point on columns, and we don't see it, like for example, our cathedral has these pillar-like things, but they're not columns. And the difference is, is that columns are architectural representations of people. People holding up the buildings. It's actually a very scriptural idea. And so that gets translated often, of course, into statues. But even simple columns, the classical columns, uh, do have symbolic representations. We have early Christian churches. There's the Byzantines, the Carolingian, Romanesque, Baroque, Gothic. You might have heard some of these. And they all have their own particular style, their own particular uh, aspect which sets them apart. Um, you also have a movement which unfortunately thought it was a good idea to just simply build meeting houses as churches. Um, the idea being, of course, that well, the early Christians met in homes. I said, yes, because they were being killed in public. So they were hiding. You know, the minute that was gone, we started building churches. So uh, that, that anachronism doesn't work very well. In the building of a church also, uh, talking about the structure of it, is the, fact, the, the factor of uh, materials. And there's supposed to be a certain nobility to materials. Okay. I call it spending money on God. Okay? And it's something that's really important to consider because there's this idea, which I don't know where it comes from, although I can guess, that, oh, I, I can't, we can't spend all that money on the church. You know, vessels, vestments, anything. Well, no, we, we need to do that because it's one of the ways that we show our love. I mean, anyone who is, uh, has a significant other or children or parents knows that one of the many ways that we show our love is to give them things. Um, and not things that they need, because obviously God doesn't need anything. But it's to show our love that we do it. That's why we accept the little scrawled picture in crayon from the five-year-old. We don't frame it and put it in the living room necessarily, but we accept it, maybe put it on the fridge for a little bit until they moved on to something else. But we accept it because of the intention that's given. And of course we we give what we can. Um, and so we collectively can give more than crayons on paper. We can, we can give more when we build buildings. But just to, to drive this point home very clearly, because it's, if nothing else, as a priest, it's very frustrating to hear these arguments. Uh, there's at least three instances I refer to in the Holy Gospels where this idea of giving God noble, costly things uh, is pointed out. The first one is with the, the Magi. You know, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are not cheap things. You know, obviously gold is the most obvious to us. And as a side note, I've heard it said that it's because of those gifts, especially the gold, that they were actually able to pick up and move to Egypt on a moment's notice. So there's the, those noble gifts that were given to the incarnate God. You also have the amount of balm that is used on Christ's body after he's dead is a kingly amount. But the one that I think is the most important and the most obvious, even from the words of our Lord himself, is when Mary um, washes his feet with her tears, dries them with her hair, and then breaks open this jar of really expensive ointment over his feet. And who is it that objects? Judas. Judas the tightwad says this could have been sold and given to the poor. And of course it says right there in the scriptures because he was a thief and wanted to kept the money for himself. But our Lord rebukes him and says no let her do this. So our Lord knows that it's good for us. And we'll see this in one of your handouts. I'm not going to go through the whole thing but one of the, uh, on the, the, the stapled, well, I guess they're both stapled. Yes, the, the second page of the stapled one has a chart, which might be hard to read unless you squint, but you can read it later. But one of the things that you'll see on that chart is nobility of materials. So that chart is a summary of um, our use of these materials in the building of churches. I take most of it from Exodus and the building of the tabernacle in the desert. 
I also put in other Old Testament and New Testament references and then the current general instruction. So, and again, I'm just pointing out one line there talking about the fact that nobility of materials is a particular point that God insisted on. Again, not because he needs it, because, but because we need to make that sacrifice out of love. All right, so... Okay, so let's talk then more concretely about the purpose, which is what I really wanted to emphasize tonight. The, the theology of a church, and of course, most of this evening, if I say church, I mean the church building, not the mystical body of Christ. And the biggest principle to understand here is that a church is where God is and where heaven meets earth, and therefore where heaven meets earth. And that has to be seen in everything that goes into a church. Now, so a lot of people love to argue, well, he can be in that little wooden hut in the Philippines. Well, of course he can. And that's what they can provide him. We can provide nice, large, brick, ornate structures, and so we should do so. The thing about this is that we have to not make statements with our churches that are artistic, necessarily. The art is at the service of worship. Um, beauty is not merely in the eye of the beholder. There's this whole idea that you know everything is subjective in this regard. Well there is a subjective element to it. Um, I do think that people are trained to appreciate ugly things. Brock music, you know, I don't know. You have to, you have to be taught to appreciate it. But, um, I mean the heavy stuff of course. Um, but I'd love to do an exercise one day where I take a bunch of these old church goods catalogs that are just taking up space in the office and cut and paste ugly and beautiful furnishings, tabernacles, all this other stuff and take them to a kindergarten classroom and give them a bunch of markers and say, okay, I want you to circle the really nice stuff. Because I think it's innate. I think we have a sense of beauty and that we have to be educated out of it to appreciate things like modern art in churches. Why is that a problem? Okay, I'm not condemning modern art outright, at least not in this presentation. What I am saying though that in churches a meaning has to be conveyed because we are teaching by these images. This is not an exercise in abstraction like, well I kind of see a dove in seven flames there. No. You need to be able to walk in and now you may need to be taught what a dove in seven flames represents, but you shouldn't have to guess what it is. You should be able to say, oh, I get it. Okay, that's these things. And then, of course, as Catholics, we know that the anchor is a symbol for hope. We know that the 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 Blessed Sacrament is a symbol for charity. We know that the the fish represents Jesus Christ. Uh, dang it. Son of God, Savior, okay? Um, or what the INRI over the cross represents, IHS, all these monograms and all these other symbols. And it's important that they're clear and visible and obvious because they teach. The lives of the saints, or in our case, for example, the mysteries of the rosary, can be taught from our windows because they're beautiful. And so we have to be very clear on that. Um, that something is being conveyed by sacred art and architecture and that it is not abstract. We see also, Father mentioned in his, uh, he quoted from Sacramentum Caritatis last time, paragraph 35. He said, the liturgy is a radiant expression of the Paschal mystery in which Christ draws us to himself and calls us to communion. This is no mere aestheticism, but the concrete way in which the truth of God's love in Christ encounters us, attracts us, and delights us, enabling us to emerge from ourselves and drawing us toward our true vocation, which is love. Taking us out of ourselves. That's very important. Further on in that same paragraph of the document, the beauty of the liturgy is part of this mystery. It is a sublime expression of God's glory and in a certain sense a glimpse of heaven on earth. 
Beauty then is not mere decoration, but rather an essential element of liturgical action. It's very important that we have beauty because, and I don't know if he mentioned this last time, I don't recall seeing it in the notes, but the Greeks associated unity, truth, goodness, and beauty all together. Everything that exists has some aspect of that. And the more you have of one, the more you have of the other, because there's a coherence to these realities. So, what are the realities that we're talking about? What are the realities that are being presented by our church architecture? Well, the first is Eden. Now this one, again, I don't think I've seen this one as much as others, but uh, I have seen it, and in, in the, again, the book I was reading, How to, How to Read a Church, uh, emphasized that you know, when you see carved into columns blossoms and leaves and, and fruits and all that, when you see uh, wrought iron that's in the shape of, of leaves and such, what, you're, what that's trying to evoke is the fact that the, the church building allows us to experience in the way that we do now since the fall, what Adam and Eve experienced and what their offspring were supposed to experience, and that is intimacy in paradise with God. You know, there's that scene where after the fall, God is walking in the garden among them. You know, that presence of God in the garden, which we see now in the way we have the presence of God in the, in the Eucharist, is certainly evoking um, Eden. Also, because, and I'll get to this in a minute, because our uh, churches also harken back to the temple, it's one of the things that the Temple of Solomon also did in its ornamentation was to emphasize that this is paradise for now. Another thing, uh, and I'm just going to touch on this just briefly like Eden, is to look at the church as the bark of Peter. Now we don't use that word very often, so I'll just think ship. Unless you speak Spanish, in which case it's the same. Uh, the, there's a, a similar word. The, the place where you sit in the congregation, it's not called the congregation. The place where you sit is called the nave, the boat. And it is because it is in the church that we are carried into salvation, that we make port in paradise, so to speak, that we traverse the uh, stormy oceans of this life in the church and then are brought safely home. So that's another image. Uh, I know that there, I was told that there are some churches which the ceiling is specifically designed to have the curve of a boat. And of course the, the, the wood would evoke that as well if that's, if that's what the ceiling is made of. So it's, um, that's another image that we have, um, which of course is defeated by fan-shaped churches because those would not float very well. But Now, of the two really important ones though, we have, the fir this third one is heaven on earth and the heavenly Jerusalem. This is very important because it is one of the things we have to keep in mind to counter the idea of church as living room. Okay? Uh, again, how you look at what a church is for is how you're going to treat its construction and later its ornamentation. And the wood paneling and the comfy chairs in the sanctuary and the plush carpet are, and potted plants, pet peeve, drives me absolutely nuts, um, are not for a church. They are for your living room. And please, decorate your living rooms well. But we don't treat a church as a living room. It's not what it is. One of the things, for example, you'll see, um, and it's visible here in, in several of our parishes in the diocese, that marble floor evokes that sea of glass that's before the throne of God in the book of Revelation, which gives us a lot of our imagery. Uh, another thing is that it's elevated. Mount Zion, the New Jerusalem, the fact that we are closer to heaven up high is, why our, is one of the reasons why our sanctuaries are elevated. Um, now that's more of a Latin thing. In the East, for example, the Greeks have iconostasis, which just means wall of icons. And those are massive doors with these big images of the saints on them, and those you just don't go back into. Now, 
you know, we could have altar rails. There's are still perfectly legitimate options because the sanctuary is supposed to be somehow cordoned off. But um, the fact is, is that it's elevated and raised because it is there that we are entering in a particular way. We are approaching the heavenly Jerusalem in the sanctuary. So it's one of the many reasons why you come forward to receive communion. Because you are approaching Mount Zion. There's a great passage in Hebrews, which... I just now remember to add, talking about you have drawn near to Mount Zion and the city of the living God and the sprinkled blood which speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. We don't see it a lot here because we either do the nice rectangular ones or fan shapes these days, but square churches are also um, a traditional pattern for a church. Not because there's no focus, but simply because uh, again, the heavenly Jerusalem is described cubically, that it's, it's a square. And so there's this, obviously there's a practical side to that too. It increases your, your volume when you do it that way. But the cube then, of course, is harkens of, of the general construction, pardon me, harkens to this idea of the heavenly Jerusalem. And of course we see in our sanctuaries images of the saints. All right, so the fourth area and the last one I'm going to talk about in regards to the purpose of our buildings, what, they're, what drives the, the design of them, is the tabernacle and temple. So, <clears throat> the problem is, is that we live in a time where people who are too smart for their own good decided that sacrifice was a bit... To, we've been emphasizing that too much in the church. Well, the fact is, is that we're going to keep doing it because that is the principal reality we're dealing with at Mass. So, just in case you've given into the propaganda that everything changed with the Second Vatican Council, however, I'm going to give you just two major examples since the 1960s that make this point. The first one being the explicit words of Pope St. John Paul II in his official teaching on the, La on the Lord's Supper, Dominice Cene, he says, black and white, the Mass is primarily sacrifice. Now that does not mean that there are not other aspects to it. That does not mean that when the Council and other documents refer to the Lord's Supper that we participate in, that they're being heretical. It does mean, however, that there is a primacy to the sacrificial element. And that's very important because people have been attempting for many years now to usurp that idea. The second thing is I'm going to go to the words of the Mass itself. You can criticize anything in the past, but the Missal, which is officially promulgated right now, that we use every day in the ordinary form of the Latin Rite, and this is just in the ordinary of the Mass, not the, uh, the propers that change, every week, or that change every Mass. Sacred Mysteries is mentioned. Sacrifice is mentioned six times. Offerings or offer in the sense of offering sacrifice ten times. Oblation once. Blood or covenant once. Victim, which is the thing that is sacrificed four times. Altar, which is where sacrifice takes place twice. Lamb, four times. And then, of course, every prayer over the gifts that the priest prays pretty much uses the words sacrifice or oblation. Now, those cha can change every Mass but those words are in there because that's what's going on at that moment. So again, not to detract from everything, but to keep in the front of our minds very clearly that is the primary reality, which is why we look at the tabernacle of the Exodus or the temple in Jerusalem as the prototype for what we are doing because that's where the sacrifices took place. You'll see this this battle that goes on ideolo ideologically in the symbols we've been using. So for example, in my parish, which is very beautiful in a lot of ways, I'm very happy I'm there than other parishes in this diocese I will not name, based on the architecture. But the only thing I would change, God bless whoever chose it, is the tabernacle. If I could only change one thing, it would be it. Because it has a somewhat abstract loaf and fish, and then a really abstract band of fishes in kind of a loop pattern, you know, the, the, the Christian fish, the ichthus. It's kind of a, a loopy thing. And then the other side is this pattern of like half loaves of bread. 
and then little stones stuck on it like refrigerator magnets. Okay? Um, but you see that so much in publications, um, in, in art, in banners that are bought for churches by people who are forsaking the primacy of sacrifice. You know, instead of having um, lamb, especially the lamb that was slain, or the pelican, which is piercing its breast so that it may feed its young. It's mythological. It's not, you know, I don't think we've ever been able to find a pelican doing that, but they thought they did that. In the words of the, pun, of the uh, Adoro Te Devote, St. Thomas poetically refers to our Lord as, as the holy pelican feeding us with his blood. Um, so instead of these sacrificial images, we get these uh, warm and fuzzy meal images. Now, is it a meal? Absolutely. Is it, a, is it our foretaste of that marriage banquet in heaven? Absolutely. But it's not primarily what's going on. And so we have to be very careful, not because we need to simply stop using loaves and fishes as imagery, but to remember that there is something more important going on, which is why there has to be an image of our Lord crucified in the sanctuary. That is the primary reality, and that has to be there as according to the, the rubrics of the church. Uh, in that vein, of course, I, I also failed to mention, you know, people love using images of the Last Supper with the Eucharist, but they, 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 they're a bit more loath these days to use images of Calvary with the Eucharist. There's some wonderful woodcuts with uh, angels catching the blood of Christ with chalices, you know. This connection between the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and what we do at Mass. We then participate in that in Mass and therefore the church reflects that. We as members of his body participate in that worship and we can only worship properly in Christ. This is what's so important. That's why it's so important that we, um, we look at our theology of this, especially with regard to our separated brethren who might be pleasing to God in certain ways but are not truly entering the worship of God that God, that God intended because they do not have the holy sacrifice of the Mass. They do not have the Eucharist. Because it is only Jesus Christ that offers true worship. And therefore, we can only worship truly by, being, by participating in the way that He's offering that. And how do we do that? In a given time and place, a, an ordained priest through the ministry of the church, the authority of the church, using the prescribed rites of the church, makes it present to us. It's a wormhole for those of you who get that imagery, okay? A, a relatively geeky but maybe more understandable imagery would be the liturgy, the merits of Christ on the cross, the worship of God is like the internet. But you've got to have the computer, the user interface, and some connection to your internet service provider. That's the priest, the missal, the bread and wine, the rites of the church. Okay? So all of that has to be there in this, wor in this worship. All right? Now, let's look at your handouts now. Um, the one I want you to look at first, please, is the one with the tent on the top, with all the dots on the, outside, on the rim of it. Yes, the tabernacle. That... It's the one with the, the church and the temple at the bottom and the one with the, the tent of meeting up top with the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, you can't be looking at it because that's the wrong... There we go. Right, that one right there. Do you see which one I mean? It's got the Ark of the Covenant in it. I think it's the Jones. <laughs> okay, someone hold it up so, I can, so we can show them which one I'm talking about. Right. Okay, that one. Very good. All right. Look at what you've got there. Okay, this is where the sacrifices to God took place in the Old Testament. I guess it would help if I had my copy out. So, there is an outer courtyard and an inner courtyard. And you progressively get narrower and narrower. So then you have the table for the bread and the lampstand, the incense altar... And this dashed line there, that next dashed line, is the Holy of Holies. And that's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. What is significant about the Ark of the Covenant? Why is that 
in the innermost part of the of the tabernacle. This is the way they directly communed with God. That's where God was. His presence was on the Ark of the Covenant. And therefore, there are two veils plus the, the whole tent itself. There is an increasing holiness as you get closer to the presence of God. And you see that, if you go down one, similarly with the temple in Jerusalem. The court of the Gentiles. Non-Jews were not allowed any further than that. The men and the women who were just the, you know, lay people didn't go any further than their courts. Then you had the inner court and finally the Holy of Holies where only the high priest would go once a year. And as I understand it, he had a rope tied around him so that if he died in the presence of God, he could be pulled out again without something having to go get him. That's how special that place was. Now, compare that to the, we have people holding conversations in our sanctuaries um, when people were struck dead for walking in there who shouldn't have been in there. Yeah, in the Old Testament. So, yes, no, God has not gotten any softer. What did he do in the chapter 2 of the Gospel of John? Takes a cord and makes a whip and drives out people who are not using the temple for what its purpose was. And that was the worship of God. So, sorry, I'm going to not continue that rant. <laughs> I just don't understand the idea that we can be in a church and just be chattering among ourselves and not giving attention to God, which is the purpose of the building. Well, let's, let's continue looking at the purpose of the building then. Go ahead and flip over to the other side of that, that handout. This diagram is one that I put together to talk about the heaven meeting earth. And this kind of ties together both uh, elements that I was talking about are the most important. The fact that we are participating in the worship of God in heaven in the heavenly Jerusalem and we are present at Calvary. So what you have, well, okay, let me pull up the picture again. Oh, I don't, yes. Oh, thank you. About time. All right. So what you see here is you've got these two arrows meeting in the middle of the sanctuary, okay? at the altar and then that kind of tabernacle thing that's supposed to be on top of the altar there where our Lord and the Eucharist is, all right? You have the Blessed Trinity, of course, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Son, of course, being our point of contact with the Trinity. We are sons of God in the Son of God. God doesn't just simply legally adopt us with a sheet of paper. He unites us to Himself through His Son taking our human nature. And on, that's, that's, of course, universally. And then in particular, when it comes to the worship of the Mass, he has ordained certain of his ministers, set them aside, given them the app, if you will, to perform this particular function on behalf of the people. And so the movement is from the congregation into the sanctuary. We come into the church, but the priest keeps going. You know, this is kind of the procession into the sanctuary on our behalf, per particularly vested and ordained to do what he's doing. I believe Father Braun did talk about vestments last time. That's part of the outward symbolism of the priest having to cover over his own sinfulness and his own he weakness and putting on Christ to step forward on our behalf. There's a connection here between the altar and the altar rail. Now I know not every church has an altar rail, but the theology of the altar rail is fascinating. I didn't know this until I learned it in seminary, but I found it to be a very interesting point. The altar rail was designed in such a way, and the fact that people would come up and receive communion at the altar rail, as an extension of the altar. So even before people started putting jackhammers to our sanctuaries, there really was an altar, so to speak, facing y'all. It was the altar rail. And that was where the priest would come to the, the main altar facing the other way when he was talking to God, interfacing with God on your behalf. But then when God came to interface with you in Holy Communion, he came down, God came to the altar rail where you met. 
And so that's the, the purpose of the, of the gray shaded area is one, you know, the, the, the upper frontier is where your representative meets God, but then the bottom part of it is where God's representative meets you. So it's a, very, it's a very beautiful imagery if we keep in mind what it is that's going on and the holiness, etc., of what's going on. Now, I said this is where heaven meets earth. Well, I have the word saints and angels on there, but that's kind of dry, so I also put this wonderful picture at the bottom. I have no idea where this church is, but you see that all in the apse of the sanctuary are statues of the saints because... We are meeting heaven at the altar. This whole idea of making, bringing the altar out closer to you and wrapping around it makes us a closed circle on ourselves and we can't do anything on our own. And it's false to the reality of what's going on. We do make a circle around the altar. We make a circle around the altar in heaven. And every mass that is being offered is like a spoke that meets up against the altar in heaven where the angels and saints are on the other side of it. So we really are creating a circle, but with the entire church, not just with our little group in our particular time and place, but with the church universal and triumphant. It's a very important imagery and reality. Think about it. What do we sing before the Eucharistic prayer every single Mass? We sing the Sanctus, the Holy, 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 the words of the angels, because angels really are singing with us at that, mo at that moment. In the Roman canon, and I can never remember the words, hopefully if I'm ever in a concentration camp or something, I will, but, you know, be pleased to, you know, see, I can't do it. <laughs> the, the, your angel may take the sacrifice to your altar in heaven. That there's that connection between the altar that we're at in a given moment and the altar in heaven much easier if you're a sci-fi fan to visualize this, but, uh, but what we're doing is we are connecting to this greater reality than what's really going on there. It's not just us having a party in the name of Jesus. It's us participating in this great mystery which is far more than what we can put together on our own, that we have to receive it. I'm not going to go through a lot of them, but if you really, if you haven't read Scott Hahn's The Lamb's Supper, uh, move it to the top of your list. It's his commentary on both the book of Revelation and the Mass because they go together. And in that book he makes a lot of connections pointing out that the book of Revelation is not primarily an end of the world book. It's primarily a liturgical book and the interaction between heaven and earth. So for example, Christ appears first in the book robed as high priest. Chapter 1 verse 13. There's an altar all throughout the book. There are priests, there are vestments, incense, there's a prominence to Our Lady, the intercessions of the angels and saints. Look at the structure even of it. John has this vision on the Lord's Day. And after the introduction, the first several chapters are a call to repentance. And then a book is opened with the seals that are being broken open up to the halfway point of the book. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb happens. I mean, it's the Mass. The book of Revelation is the Mass. Because the Mass is our worship of God, is participation in our worship of God in heaven. And my last comment I'd like to make, um, it's not technically on these diagrams, but I mean, I, I commented on the, the images of the saints in the sanctuary, of course. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is the furnishings and the direction of the liturgy. And this is just one of those things that I find very neat. And I think it, pardon me, really helps with an understanding of the Mass. Because going, go right, going right along with the architecture, of course, is the furnishings and the ornamentation. So there are three major liturgical furnishings in a sanctuary. Now I will ask for volunteers on this one. What are they? Bueller? Anyone? The altar, very good. All right, say it with confidence. What else? The tabernacle. Actually, not. It, no, no, it's 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 imp it's the most important thing in the sanctuary because of what it is. But I'm talking about from a. a it's not a furnishing. That's why. <laughs> there we go. There's the answer. It's not a furnishing. The chair and the ambo. 
Why? Again, the tabernacle is its own entity. It's not a, not a furnishing or a decoration. That's God, okay? Because it's the three offices of Jesus Christ. Priest, prophet, and king. The ambo is prophet, teaching, the will of God. That's why the ambo is at the front of the sanctuary or in the nave itself. Because it's that this double direction, as we see in this diagram, of the word of God, his will being taught and preached out from heaven to you. The, the chair is a symbol of authority, of kingship. And the more your authority, the bigger your chair, which is why here the bishop gets a nice fancy one, right? Okay. Because the chair is a symbol of his authority. In the, in the scriptures, see, sitting is a symbol of authority. Christ goes up the mountain and sits to teach. Moses is seated when he judges. And it's the, it's the being seated is a symbol of, uh, of authority. And so that's why, let's face it, this church is named after a chair. The cathedral is named after the bishop's cathedra, his seat. And thirdly, the altar, which is the priestly aspect, the priestly office, which is, what is a priest? By means of sacrifice, bringing the people to God. That's the direction of priesthood. You see it in salvation history, and you see it in the Mass. The fact that the Word of God is taught outward, but then at the offertory, and then especially, of course, during the Eucharistic prayer, we offer sacrifice to God by participating in Christ's sacrifice. We offer ourselves, of course, but that's, the, that's what's going on at that moment. And that's why it is uh, very symbolic and appropriate for Mass to be said at you know, altars that are, that are closer to the wall. Now, I'm not going to get into the arguments because uh, there's... Even our current liturgical documents betray that there are ideological battles going on and that both sides are getting their hands in the writing of the rubrics. So I don't want to go into that. But there is something correct about saying Mass with everyone facing the same way. Again, based off of this diagram and the idea that it's not that the priest's back is to you. It's because he's facing God and he's facing God with you. So... Regardless of which way the priest is facing, he's really bringing us to God when he's at the altar, because that's what the altar is for. And again, just to, to wrap up that one point, so that I put a little, uh, round out the argument a little bit more. What you can basically see when you got the two directional thing is, the argument basically is either the priest is acting as your representative and talking to God, or he's God's representative addressing you, but of course really at that part of the Mass, who is he addressing? All the prayers are addressed to God the Father. So, that's why in the rubrics of the Mass, because I love the subject and I'm not going to let it go, I really will try, give me a second. Uh, no matter what way the priest says Mass, the rubrics do say, and turning toward the people he says, which means that he may not always be doing so. Yes? Do you think we'll see that back to the way I was raised, where the priest does face the tabernacle? It's not forbidden. The rubric that is invoked that says that it sh it's preferable to do it facing the people, um, my understanding has been mistranslated from the Latin. Um, but depending on the circumstances, I mean, you still see it. I know there are several priests in this diocese that do it. Um, I'll do it for catechetical things with the youth. I know one Lent, Father Vavrick did it in his parish as a Lenten thing, I guess, you know, so it still happens. Um, personally, I can't stand being distracted while I'm praying the Eucharistic prayer, so I actually really like that, because guaranteed someone's going to get up and go to the bathroom, so. <laughs> Good timing there, thank you. <laughs> I asked them to do that. So anyway, um, so, yeah, that's not a battle that I'm willing to fight right now, because there are more important things to worry about, but there's something very important to doing that symbolically. And like I said, it's much easier for me. All right. Two directions, furnishings. We've talked about the handout. Very good. All right. Let's then go to the last major thing I want to talk about, and then we'll go to Q&A. And that is ornamentation. Now, I've, I've given you the handout. Um, I guess I could 
really just read the whole thing to you. Um, but I don't have one, so I can't. Thank you, Eric. Oh, no, we're good. We got Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll take it, though. You can get one. Man, thank you. Before I look at the handout, though, I do want to read you what one of the quotes that Father Braun used last week. I can find it. Now, this pertains to vestments, but I want you to keep it in mind uh, for ornamentation as well, because obviously this is not um, chemistry. Um, this is all an organic whole that, that it all relates to each other. So this is on, from the general instruction of the Roman Missal on sacred vestments. It says, it is fitting that the beauty and nobility of each vestment derive not from abundance of overly lavish ornamentation, but rather from the material that is used and from the design. Which you could simply change the word uh, vestment to sanctuary and it would make my point perfectly that I'm trying to make here. I am just going to read to you real quick because um, the people at home don't have this. What do we mean by ornamentation? An ornament is an accessory article or detail used to beautify the appearance of something to which it is added or of which it is a part. And so let's apply that to a church sanctuary. The sanctuary is not a blank pallet that some artsy person gets free reign on to make look the way they want. The sanctuary should already be gorgeous and you just simply change the frame, uh, like a gorgeous picture, which you simply just change the frame on occasionally. Okay? There is supposed to be a noble simplicity. And I give two examples here of what I'm talking about. A felt antipendium. What's an antipendium? It's a thing that pens ante. It's the thing that hangs in front of the altar or the ambo. All right? <coughs> A felt antipendium down in the front of the altar is simple but ignoble. And a mountain of poinsettias or lilies, yes, I made this point on purpose, around every furnishing of the sanctuary is noble but not simple. And as I point out on here, no ornamentation should constitute an obstacle course for the priests in the sanctuary. So. Flowers being a big one, but it's very important to note in the general instruction, there are only two kinds of ornamentation foreseen in the general instruction. Flowers and cloth. So the antipendia, for example, or maybe something covering the pedestal of a statue, and flowers. Now, an important point that I put on there, because I found it, again, one of those fascinating things once I learned it. The flowers are supposed to be cut flowers, not potted because they're offered in sacrifice. It's a sacrifice, they're going to die. And we put those there just, sorry, to accent. You know, I love the idea that so many Hispanics at, at quinceaneras and weddings like to present the flowers to the Virgin Mary. It's beautiful, you know. But, you know, and I go back to the poinsettias thing. It's not just here, it's all over, you know. But these mounds of potted plants all over, or just ferns, like, the other thing is, it says flowers, not greenery, you know? So, and there's just, for me, I, I emphasize the practical a lot because it gets messy and then things got to stay watered and, anyway, it's not what it's there for. This is a perfect example of a gorgeous sanctuary. This does not need a lot. If you go into this, into the cathedral, the, the huge stained glass window, the nice marble floor, the ambo, the altar, I love the metal work uh, around the back wall, around the tabernacle. There's a, well, see symbolism. There's pomegranates on there. It's a liturgical symbol because the um, vestment, I think it's the tunic, of the high priest in Exodus had bells and pomegranates along the bottom of it. So just a, a symbol there. Um, okay. At this point, I'm just going to simply open it up for questions because that covers the majority of what I wanted to say. Um, and I'm sure that I stirred up a lot. You may have a lot of questions. Be prepared for a lot of I don't knows. But I'll certainly try to sound like I know what I'm talking about. So, Yes, ma'am. 
I don't know where I had, I don't recall where I heard this or read it, uh, but some time ago, this is in regards to your comments about the altar rail that you uh -huh. saw all the churches. And of course, in, in my time, we not only had the altar rail, but they had a linen cloth that they would flip over when it came time for communion. Oh, there you go. Put your hands under it and so on. Right. And it was pointed out that the altar rail at that point actually represented the banquet. Mm -hmm. they put a cloth on it. And so the sacrifice took place on the altar, the sacrificial part, and then the partaking of the sacrificial banquet mm -hmm. was actually done at the altar rail uh, with the linen cloth over it and so on. You mean there was a reason for all those things? Sir? You mean there was a reason for all those things we did? Yes. Very good. And of course, some have said now that we don't have altar rails, and the people just go up that we've lost some of that sign value of partaking, actually, of the Last Supper. Um, you know, because we don't, well, we kind of go up and just get things given to us, you know, instead of actually kneeling there with the cloth over it and being more holy. Oh, there's, there's a whole slew of things which, uh, if you ever distribute Holy Communion, you know that we've lost because of these ideologies which have gotten rid of things that we did in the past. I mean, I can't, I mean, hmm, <laughs> how much desecration probably goes on of the Blessed Sacrament just kills me. Um, and then, of course, I'm rigid and, you know, all these other stupid words that people use uh, because they don't like a priest who actually tells them they need to do something differently. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Receive communion properly, people. It's Jesus. All right? <laughs> we got to take care of Jesus. <laughs> I can't believe I actually have to say that, but you do. Anyone else before I continue that rant? In, in our Yeah. Well, you know why communion was only under one species? Because at the time of Trent, people believed that they weren't getting all of Jesus if they didn't get both. And guess what's happening these days? The minute you don't distribute the precious blood, Father, I'm not, we didn't get the blood. Yes, you did. <laughs> you just didn't get it under that species. You got the blood with the body in the host. So we're coming full circle on that again because Trent knew what it was doing. But, um, but before the species, what else did you say? About how we receive. Yeah, it's like, give me, you know, instead of, it's, you know, for example, and I have to, by, have, by going to communion standing, whether you receive, even if you receive on the tongue standing, and for some reason it's Hispanics that do this most, so I've got to make, do a homily about this soon at my parish, is they'll do the whole grab thing with their lips is instead of, because it used to be when you were kneeling, the host was dropped practically, which greatly minimized chances of, of, of the host falling or you being licked. It gets really old people. I don't want your saliva on my hands, you know. Because they do this whole, it's like they're receiving in the hand but with the lips, right? They're grabbing and bobbing for, for Jesus, you know. And it's, uh, yeah. There's many good reasons for why we did things the way we did, and we're seeing them now, again, because we've just simply fallen back into things. So, yes, ma'am. I have a question, and if you don't feel comfortable answering it, that's fine. But I've heard murmurings among our congregation of some interest in, in having a communion rail put in the cathedral. What are your thoughts on that, and do you think that could ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean the, do you think it could happen? I'm not going to venture, I guess, on that one. That gets all kinds of political. Um, my thought, well, I think my thoughts on having an altar rail are very clear. I think that we have lost, this goes to another one of my pet peeves, we have lost a sense of the sacred, sacred being set apart. The fact is, um, you are not priests. Before I was ordained, I was not a priest. I am now a priest. I am not a layman. The church is not an auditorium. The church is not a social hall. 
we've got a room right here for that. We should use it more often, you know. Um, but even more so, we think it's adorable when children, first of all, who are being let loose, I don't know why, uh, are in the middle of the Mass, as I'm trying to pray the Eucharistic prayer, are running up and getting into the sanctuary. It's like, that's not cute. It's, there is, you know, and the parents aren't horrified by it. No, we don't fault the child, of course. Got no problems with that. I'm only faulting parents. <laughs> I love children. Parents, got some work to do, all right? Um, but we've lost that. It's like, it's like, I can imagine some of your parents, if you ran up to the altar rail, or exactly, you wouldn't be here, exactly, you know? Uh, not because God wants to smite us, but because it's respect, you know? It's that there are places that are holy. You remove your shoes, not in church, please, but Moses was asked to remove his shoes on holy ground, etc., okay? You do these outward things for our benefit, not for God's. So an altar rail, I think, would be a great symbol for that. And also, again, the fact that if you know what an altar rail is for, not only to demark the sacred, but also the table at which you are participating. And they can look really nice, too. I mean, they add a, uh, you know, something to the sanctuary so they can be ornamented more. Sir? I'm retired military and we, I've been to masses, places where there was no sanctuary. I mean, there was a place where the, cons the consecration took place. Um, but it wasn't really separate from anywhere mm -hmm. else. And, um, and we, I've seen that recently. And to me, if I knew what I knew then, now, you know, I, I think it should have been done differently. Oh, so you're not talking about the back of a Humvee. No, I'm talking about a table in the middle of a room with people all around. Like at an established chapel or downrange yeah, deployment? Well, certainly if you don't have access to something. I mean, I've been to masses in a hotel room when the priests just simply, you know, were traveling and there was no way to get to the church or the church was closed, you couldn't get a hold of the priest or whatever. But certainly, I mean, I've, I've attended the Holy Sacrifice numerous times in a wooden bee hut in Afghanistan. Um, we did try to design the chapel with a demarcation, but yeah, I mean, it's the mass needs to be done in, in the proper place as well. You don't just do it anywhere if you can help it. <laughs>